Okay, so let's start our review videos for our unit on the judiciary. This is unit 2C. So the first flashcard is just simply Article 3. Article 3 is the shortest of the first three articles uh, dealing with each of the three branches, Article 1, Legislative, Article 2, Executive, Article 3, Judicial. And Article 3 doesn't say a, a whole lot, but it does establish that there will be a Supreme Court. It does establish what the original jurisdiction of the court will be, as opposed to its appellate jurisdiction. It says the Supreme Court will have appeals jurisdiction, appellate jurisdiction in uh, cases as Congress see fits. But it also establishes cases that it will hear. Um, but most of what the Supreme Court does is it hears appeals. It doesn't actually hear original cases. It also establishes that justices will have a lifelong tenure or they will serve during times of good behavior subject to impeachment. Um, but a lot of the court structure is set up by uh, the, the Congress, and the court system is set up by Congress. So we'll talk about that as we move forward. Uh, the flashcard number two, Federalist number 78, written by Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton says quite a bit of uh, interesting things in this particular Federalist paper about the judicial branch. Um, he argues that the judicial branch is the weakest of the three branches, that it has neither the sword nor the purse, simply judges, simply judgment. And so therefore, it shouldn't be uh, is it considered a threat to liberty. But at the same time, he argues that the Supreme Court should have judicial review, or they should have the authority to strike down actions of the other branches at con uh, as unconstitutional. He says this is a real important um, you know, bulwark against uh, the other branches. So he's saying they should have immense power, but also we don't have to worry about their power at the same time, which is an interesting um, kind of uh, contrast. He also argues for life tenure of justices. He says this is really important to keep them um, above politics, to make the job one that is uh, in a, appealing to them, um, and to make sure that they can make, um, make decisions free of public pressure. So, you know, he argues for a, a powerful Supreme Court that we don't need to fear because they don't have too much power, which is, which is interesting. Um, in <clears throat> uh, uh, flashcard number three, going along with the arguments of Hamilton in Federal 78, we touch on a key important uh, Supreme Court case for, um, uh, for our course, and that is Marbury v. Madison. So I'm not going to go through all the details of the case right now. I mean, it's a very complicated case, but, but fundamentally what it does is it establishes that the Supreme Court can strike down uh, actions of other branches, and particularly laws of Congress, as unconstitutional. Um, they basically uh, you know, said in this particular case that Congress had expanded their original jurisdiction, which was set out in Article 3 of the Constitution, and they said Congress doesn't have the right to do that. Uh, and so they, they struck down um, this particular, uh, particular part of uh, Congress's establishing of what the courts can do. Uh, this was a, all a dispute about um, whether John Adams could appoint judges uh, at the very end of his term and then uh, whether courts could order um, um, uh, government officials to kind of deliver those commissions, uh, even though um, they don't necessarily have that authority under the Constitution. So that's what the case basically was about. But the big takeaway is that it's the first time the court establishes they have judicial review because that's not in Article 3. That's not in Article 3. What is in Article 3 is its original jurisdiction. So they can, de for example, a few instances they deal with cases of disputes between states or instances of ambassadors or of maritime jurisdiction. Um, but uh, again, most of what the court does is they hear appeals through their appellate jurisdiction. So cases that have gone before lower courts or cases that um, might uh, come through state court systems, they can be appealed to the Supreme Court. And so speaking of lower courts, flashcard number five, the structure of the court system, it's important to know there are basically three tiers of the federal court system. You have your judicial district courts, your trial courts. That's where um, cases are originally heard. Uh, they can be appealed to appeals courts, and then those can be appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about judicial review, okay? And uh, so, uh, you know, again, just kind of reviewing, but the ability to strike down laws is unconstitutional. It also applies to actions of the executive um, or government agencies. The courts can strike those down as well. And how does it relate to arguments over the court's power? I mean, this gives the, co the court basically uh, an immense amount of power. 
Um, and it makes them, I think, much more powerful than if you just were to strictly look at what Article 3 says. And some people say the court exercises this, this power too much. And some people say the court should ex exercise it um, uh, more than they do. And that goes to judicial philosophy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. As it comes to life tenure, um, you know, we can talk about uh, the merits of, of life tenure and why it was in there. You know, I, I think, again, uh, the idea of having the, the justices be uh, apart from pol politics, not having to run for reelection, not having to appeal to some sort of constituency in the decisions they make. It does, again, make the, the job more appealing, um, <clears throat> but it also makes them, some think, unchecked. Uh, and no Supreme Court justice has ever been removed from office. Only one has been impeached and was not convicted in, this, in the Senate. This was very early on in the United States history. And uh, that being said, public opinion does have an impact on the Supreme Court. Okay, that they're not, They are insulated from public opinion, but they're not totally immune from it. And that's something to keep in mind. You know, a court can be very concerned about their legacy and how they'll be viewed. Uh, people talk about John Roberts, our current Supreme Court Chief Justice, and they say he's very interested in making sure he has a positive legacy. Um, and so, you know, they want to make sure he, you know, the, the court makes uh, sound decisions that go along with the public. And as public views change, um, court justices uh, can can change their philosophies and opinions. Um, and we can see that with the Roberts court a little bit and how John Roberts in particular has been moving a little bit to the left as public opinion has maybe migrated a little bit. So, you know, certainly public opinion does have an impact, but it's it's an impact that might uh, affect individual judges differently. Um, now, uh, when when Supreme Court uh, judges make decisions, they um, they obviously interpret the Constitution based on their uh, judicial philosophy, which we'll get at. But they use what is known as precedent. Precedent is simply the idea of using prior decisions as guidance um, when making uh, decisions on cases on similar issues. So. You know, if there's a precedent on, uh, you know, using, you know, very controversial issues that are often in the public, public uh, sphere, you know, something like abortion. If there's a, if there's a decision that's made, such as in Roe vs. Wade, which protects the right to abortion as a federally constitutionally protected right, then that's a significant precedent that guides the court when they when they hear all um, all other uh, uh, cases related to abortion. So they look at what that decision was why it was made, what that case was about. Um, and stare decisis is the, the philosophy of letting precedent stand, let the decision stand. You know, if you really believe in stare decisis, Latin for, I think, let it, let it stand, um, then, uh, then you, you're, on, you're not going to overturn precedent very easily. Uh, that doesn't mean that precedent doesn't ever get overturned. It absolutely does, and it can. Um, but usually the court only does this if they feel very, um, they feel like the court has made mistakes in the past, which of course they have, um, or if they feel there's a really compelling reason to overturn precedent uh, in, a, in a particular case. So, so those are some kind of philosophical uh, concepts there uh, that guide the, the decision making of the courts. So let me pause here with this video and we'll pick it up with the next one with flashcard number 10.